Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I'm Kili'i Akina. And although I'm a trustee in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and president of the Grassroot Institute, the views that I express and my guest expresses today are completely our own and do not represent any organization or any government agency. With that said, I'm delighted today to have a young man who has come from the private sector and is making his views known publicly, probably for the first time in any big way on an issue. Most people in Hawaii have heard that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was recently audited by the state legislative auditor. It was a scathing audit. It has just been released, and there are many, many reactions. Well, what's interesting is that the state audit caused someone who's been fairly quiet, who is a native Hawaiian beneficiary of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and an attorney, to start to speak up. He recently wrote an op-ed in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. I'm going to talk a little bit about that with him today and welcome him to the program and talk a little bit about his heritage. Please welcome to our program today, Samuel Wilder King II. Sam, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, you know, with a name like that, Samuel Wilder King II, you've got quite a legacy. I, I don't know if all of our audience knows that uh, you are the great-grandson of a Hawaii governor and you're the grandson of one of the most famous judges, Sam King. So what is it like to carry the heritage of such a profound name? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not a negative, it's fun. I mean, it's good to have. Oh, I didn't that. think it was negative at all. No, no, no. well, I mean, <laughs> to some extent, there's, a, there's an expectation level of it. My, one, of my, one of my friends pointed out, you know, I could accomplish a lot of things in life, but my grandpa did it all with one eye. So how impressive can you be in the end if you're a federal judge or anything? So there's always that expectation level. But on the other hand, I got to spend a lot of time with my grandpa and my parents and you know my dad also Sam King Jr. So that was a that was a great honor to be able to hang out with him. We had brunch every Sunday and talk with him. Mm -hmm. And then you know it's it's always funny you're walking down the street and you meet my my parents' friends when I was a little kid. They all know who I am. I'm like that. I don't I don't know who you know, who you are, but they all know me because of grandpa. So well, one of the ironies is that uh, Sam King, the judge, was very prominent in a movement that turned the Kamehameha Schools Bishop of State around, and he wrote a book. I see you've got it over there, yeah. called Broken Trust. Is, is any is there any particular reason you brought that with you today? Yeah, it was. It's. It's, By the way, he wrote it along with another mutual friend of ours, Randy Roth, Sam King and Randy Roth. It's a very relevant book to Hawaii and to OHA and to everyone that's concerned about the status of Native Hawaiians and all the trusts that benefit Native Hawaiians. It amazes me every time I ask my friends that they haven't read it, like, especially people in law school. They're always like, I haven't read it yet. And it's just, it's so vital. And the story is so shocking and so humorous to the extent of how blatant it all was. And it, it came up again recently in one of the, the think tank interviews I think we talk about. Right, so and we'll talk about that in a bit. And that's one of the things that's interesting about Hawaii that newcomers sometimes don't know right away, but eventually learn that a phenomenal amount of money, billions of dollars of trust funds that really have come to us from the Hawaiian kingdom are available today for the advancement of Native Hawaiians. And you and I are both part Native Hawaiians, so in a sense we're beneficiaries of that. And yet the administration of those trust funds has been a problem. Uh, Roth and King pointed out in Broken Trust that the Kamehameha Schools Bishop Estate had some very serious problems with regard to how they administered it. And one of the biggest tragedies is that a massive amount of money came in at the top but didn't necessarily get to meeting, get down to the bottom of the funnel to meet the needs of Native Hawaiians. We may talk a little bit about that with reference to the audit of OHA in a moment, but first I wanted to ask you, you know, what, how do you conceive of yourself as a Native Hawaiian? There, there are many, many definitions. You're a lawyer, so you know there are some legal definitions, there are some constitutional definitions. There's a difference between a small in Native Hawaiian and a large in Native Hawaiian. But just for Sam Wilder King II, well, what does it mean to you personally to be Native Hawaiian? You know, what it means is just to do everything pono, you know, righteousness, and try and do your best and work your hardest. I think. What I've always thought about and I've always conceptualized it as is if I work hard and I try and do my best and I do what I think is right for myself and my community, then I'm living what I believe are Native Hawaiian values. I don't need to espouse a certain view in any certain way or you know, believe certain belief structure. I just have to do my best and work my hardest. And 
be the best person I can be. And that's what it comes down to. It's interesting that you use the word pono, which most people know is part of our state motto, Uamaukea Okaaina Ika Pono, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness, pono. That seems to be a family value <laughs> for you in terms of, of y y your, your um, ancestors who fought so far so hard to make sure that things were right in terms of a, a legal sense. Absolutely. I'm, and that's those values, I, I hope they've been instilled in me through, over, over the many years. You know, I, we always, like I said, brunch every Sunday, we talked about not these kinds of issues in, in a specific sense, because I think to some degree, my family always wanted the, the grandchildren, especially, to kind of live their own life, do what they wanted to do. But you heard about the events going on. You heard about the way to approach and the way to think about those kinds of things. And just thinking about what's best for the community, what's best for the native Hawaiians and, all, and the entire state of Hawaii. I mean, we're in this together. It's, we're all living on this island together. So we have to work together. Recently, the state auditor released findings for an audit of the years 2015 and 16 in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And it may be good for us just to step back a moment and talk about what the purpose of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is. Constitutionally, it's to advance the conditions of Native Hawaiians. But there are lots of different views as to what it means to advance the conditions of Native Hawaiians. What's your vision, Sam, as to what really is important about advancing the conditions of Native Hawaiians here in Hawaii and across the world? I think it comes down to, you know, bread and butter issues such as you know, OHA has a research division, and you look at their website, and they have the indicators that are they're good indicators: home ownership, median income, health outcomes, poverty levels. Those kinds of things should be focused on. And if you can improve those kinds of issues for Native Hawaiians, then all Native Hawaiians are going to be better off. They're going to be happier, healthier. We're all going to live more successful lives. That's really what OHA should be focusing on. Those those are the kinds of things that I think everyone envisioned when OHA was created. It wasn't just something that was intended to be some sort of separate government that was excluded from everybody else. It was meant to be an expression of responsibility that the people of the state of Hawaii, which is why we put it in our constitution, decided to say, we really need to resolve this. We need to address these, this special group of people that were here. They have, we bear responsibility for things. Not every, they weren't treated, I mean, Hawaiians were mistreated in history. It wasn't, it wasn't all roses, you know, all the way through. And there's a certain amount of responsibility we have for that. And so I recognize that, and OHA can help Hawaiians in that way. And it's, it's a wonderful idea to be able to say, we can target this group, we can help this group. It, you know, you have to balance everything with the racial aspect, I think that's something very important to keep in mind because so it's you, worrisome. But. You basically referred to bread and butter issues, housing, jobs, education, and health care. I noticed that you excluded political uh, issues such as Hawaiian sovereignty and so forth. In fact, you had a little bit of a difficulty, didn't you, with the recent attempt by OHA to spend some money on establishing Hawaiian sovereignty through grants it gave to an organization called Na'i Aupuni. Well, what was your concern about that? Na'iyao Puni required everyone who signed up to the list to pledge their loyalty to some extent. The exact wording is, was chosen for a statutory reason to comply with some sort of um, uh, administrative rule of the federal government. But it basically said, I do believe in the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Native Hawaiian people. And whether or not you believe that is necessary or the case, or you need it to create a tribe, I don't understand why anyone should be forced to believe anything to be a Native Hawaiian. That was my fundamental objection. It required you to affirm a f historical fact that you may or may not agree with. People have a different perspective on. But you had to swear to it in order to be on the list, as, as if you cannot be part of this club if you don't have this political view. And I just So you, you, you objected to the fact that in order to be a bona fide Hawaiian on a list of Hawaiians, you had to have a very specific and narrow political view when, in reality, you wanted to be on that list because you wanted to help advocate for bread and butter issues. That's exactly right. And I ended up, I, I show up in, in the lawsuit that was recently filed that you were one of the plaintiffs right. on. And you, a, in one of the motions, I'm in the back as the only person who managed to get on the list without making that that declaration because I wrote into them and I said, I object. Well, that's interesting. But for the most part, you've been fairly quiet. You've gone through a, a fine education. You have become an attorney. You're working in private practice. You're raising your family. 
lovely wife, and you're on one or two? One, one, <laughs> right. one right now. One. <laughs> one little child and so forth. Uh, but something recently happened that made you go public and, and submit an op-ed to the Honolulu Star Advertiser on the audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. What happened that, that pushed you to do that, to leave that rather tranquil, quiet life and all of a sudden become the center of some attention? Well, the, the audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs that recently came out was just shocking. I mean, I described it as jaw-dropping, and, and, and I had more colorful adjectives, except I had to edit them out for the word count, which probably made it all better in the end. But you read through the document, and you're just astounded by the fact that this money has been thrown around with this kind of reckless disregard, as if, you know, there, you know, I was ali'i in the old days. They had to take care of the makai nana as if they were, you know, they were taking care of the land. They had to take care of them as siblings. And it seemed like when you read this Appendix A to the the, the audit, which I recommend anyone do, it you see this passing out of money to people on this random basis, as if I met you on the street and therefore I want to take care of you. That, on top of the fact that you read through some of the expenditures that they were making, uh, they, they paying for a rodeo and things like this, it just it was so amazing. I had to. I had to comment. And so the, it pushed you. It was kind of like a straw that broke the camel's back. Because I know that people have approached you in the past to try to get you involved in a more public way, even in the legal uh, case and so forth. But you've kind of been quiet. This. Well, what was it about this that was so deep that it said that it meant you know you're going to shatter that anonymity and quietness of your life. Well, I mean, to some extent, I've always I've, I've been trying to track the issues and, and learn about them and all of these things. But the, the audit was really just the, the, like you said, the straw that broke the camel's back. Because the first off, a lot of the trustees, you know, I'm they have great records. I'm sure they were all doing this with the best of intentions, and they pointed out that they were, you know, giving money to beneficiaries. They were trying to advance the cause. Maybe they misunderstood it. And my fundamental point in the end was just. You've been there too long. It, it's it's time to change. The, the audit makes clear that you know it's time for a different approach. I think it's just time for a clean slate. There's been so much back and forth with the lawsuits and the suing each other, the animosity, and then you start digging into the audit. I mean, the first part of it, I was I quoted a number. I think something like off the you know back of the envelope calculations. Twenty six percent of OHA's expenditures go on administration. OHA is a primarily a grant making organization. There there's an organization called Charity Navigator that kind of tracks these sorts of things. And they have something called the expense ratio. And it's come under criticisms. You know, some organizations that have more expertise, you know, professionals that are providing like a service directly through an individual, they might have higher salary costs. But fundamentally, what it comes down to is if you are spending too much on your administrative costs, you're not providing money to the people you're supposed to be serving. And OHA is up in the 26%. For a grant-making organization, that's a score of zero out of 10. Well, we're going to come back in a moment and look at some specifics that you wrote about. And I'll ask you what your concerns are, and you can give us some examples. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I am glad you're speaking out. My guest today is Samuel Wilder King II. And when we come back from this break, we're going to walk through the recent state audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And he's going to share from his perspective, both as an attorney and an OHA beneficiary. I'm Kili'i Akina on Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. We will be right back. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Together. That's a great thing, Hawaii Together. And there's a Hawaiian saying that has the word together in it called a pule ka ko. It's said often here at private and public functions, and it simply means a pule. Let's pray ka ko together. 
Well, one of the things that has been on my heart since coming into public life has been getting people to work together. So I coined a phrase called a hana kako, a hana kako, let's work together. Let's work together for a better economy, government, and society. Because divided, there's nothing we can do, but united, nothing can stop us. And I think that's probably something that we need to be listening to a lot more today, because so many issues fracture us as the people of Hawaii, and as observers view from across the world, it looks as though we can get very little done. That's why I like Sam Wilder King, because he brings together diverse views. He brings together diverse uh, populations who all care about the life of the land, and a word he used earlier called pono. I'm going to go back to him now, and we're going to ask him for his views on the audit. Sam, uh, recently, your views in the Star Advertiser may have been lumped together with some other commentators and called fake news, <laughs> because you, you were endorsing the audit, so to speak. You basically found that there's no reason to question the state auditor, because he's competent and he has the jurisdiction with which to conduct the investigation he conducted and so forth. But just a few days ago, there appeared a show on this very broadcast network, Think Tech Hawaii. And I'd like to encourage all of you who are out there to go ahead and look it up on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. That's thinktechhawaii.com. Look for, just Google or look for the show of Governor Waihe'e and CEO Crab talking about the audit. It's called Audit the View from the Other Side. And when you watch that, uh, and rely upon your own observation that, rather than my paraphrasing, you're, you're going to see some arguments that are made. I, I'd like to, have you seen that, Sam? I have seen it. That interview was surreal. For starters, the implication in the interview that only Native Hawaiians can criticize OHA was shocking to me. Well, there was a statement in there, and, and I, again, I want to refer our viewing public t to the actual video in which this was discussed so they could see it themselves. But Governor John Waihe'e and CEO of OHA Crab basically intimated that uh, there was a problem with the audit because the auditor himself wasn't ethnically Native Hawaiian. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's just defensive um, to the extent that somehow, and I think to some extent, they, they Governor Wahe admitted at some point in the broadcast said, you know, maybe somebody else has a better mousetrap, a better way to build a mousetrap, that would be recognized. And I, I take him at his word that that's some of good ideas can come out of the audit. And that was my conclusion. The audit had made worthwhile observations, and those observations were worth listening to, and I, as a beneficiary, was listening to them. And I found them to be shocking, and OHA has not repudiated any of them. Well, one of the uh, major premises of that interview we referred to between Governor John Waihe'e and uh, CEO Crab of OHA is that most of the money that OHA manages does not come from the taxpayer or the legislators. Instead, it comes from the Native Wine Trust Fund, which comes from the ceded lands. And therefore, the, the auditor doesn't really have, it's not really the auditor's business to be telling OHA how to use it. Now, that, that may make sense to a lot of people, but what do you think? Well, the auditor's role, and the reason the auditor has a salary from a public institution is to watch out for fraud, waste, and abuse to some extent in these organizations. And I, as a citizen, rely on state agencies such as the auditor to look out for that. Now, and when, when they the, provide me a report, I can rely on that report. When the auditor is examining these organizations, it's not just an organization, he's examining the leaders of this or these organizations who are state public officials, elected or, or appointed, uh, as it's the case of the CEO, and elected, as is the case of the trustees. And each of them has the laws of the state, the Sunshine Laws, the Ethics Laws, the Hawaii Revised Statutes. Uh, as the standard by which they need to perform. Isn't the auditor simply making reference to these standards for the most part in com comparing the performance of these a actors, these state agents, uh, to the, the standard that they should uh, act by? I, I believe that's exactly the case. I mean, it's possible that some people in OHA don't think that they're a state agency, that they're not subject to the Office of Information Practices regulations. I've, I've been assured that they are subject to OIP laws. And, it, and I value the auditor's review of the leadership, because one of the reasons the interview was surreal was Governor John Mahay was talking about how only, you know, this is our money. It's, it's the, like, as if Hawaiians, like, only us are responsible for this money, and therefore no one can speak to it. And... 
I just was reminded, you know, in pages about 89 to 92 of Broken Trust, John Wahee, they, they describe, my grandpa and Professor Roth describe how John Wahee appointed all the Supreme Court justices and then attempted to have them, at least the implication, appoint him a Bishop of State trustee. So clearly looking at the leadership of an organization is very important, not just the numbers. Looking at how they go through their process is extremely valuable. Right, and, and, and these leaders of OHA, the trustees, were actually elected by the public voters. And, and the voters need to rely, be able to rely upon the state auditor to, to tell them whether or not they're performing according to standard. Now, one of the things uh, that was interesting is that Governor Wahee and uh, CEO Crab talked about OHA using a metaphor. Call, they said OHA was a fourth branch of government. Now, I'm not going to hold them to that in a purely legal sense, but that term was thrown around quite a bit in the interview. What were your thoughts about seeing OHA as a fourth branch of government? I didn't, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And in the end, OHA is a, it's fundamentally a state agency. And they're, the only reason you can't say that with any confidence in general, because there's some sort of legal framework around it. But in the end, it's created by the state. And it's, like I said, it's an expression of the people of Hawaii's sense of responsibility for Native Hawaiians. Sure. We've looked at it and said, this is one way we can address the issues that are arising in this community. Yes. And, and while it is a state agency, it is true that OHA has a mandate that, that goes beyond that of most state agencies, because it has a specific mandate to advocate for the Native Hawaiians which comes from the Constitution. Yet your argument is sound that the actual agents of the agency need to adhere to law and policy. Now, we already talked about your first concern expressed in your op-ed, and that was the inordinate amount spent on overhead in OHA. But there was a second concern, and that was the grants process. One of the things you pointed out that the auditor made a big deal of is that through the regular grants process in 2015 and 16, OHA awarded, uh, through rigorous competition, about seven million dollars in grants. And yet, through a very non-rigorous process, some other way, uh, uh, OHA found that it could give 14 million dollars, twice as much to people, outside of their rigorous process. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, why does that really matter? The, the idea that you can have discretionary funding that non-budgeted of $14 million, double what you're planning for is absurd. They are, OHA has the ability and the capacity to budget for these expenditures. They can, have, they can have a plan that says, we will put a pot of money aside per year that you can apply to and we as the trustees can vote on it. But instead, what they were doing was the CEO was apparently coming out and adjusting the budget on the fly over the objections of the staff which, you know, at one point he said, the, the governor of Hawaii made a, a joke and said, oh, well, all your staff are auditors, which I thought was an incredible insult to the OHA staff. But that aside, the fact that the staff are objecting and then the CEO is doing it anyway, I'm not sure how that process is supposed to work. I mean, the auditor was saying the process was not being followed. So to the extent a process existed, the auditor is telling everybody, yeah, that's great, but you're not using it. So what's the point? And they're... There was an example they gave in their letter response where they said, you know, we've given money to uh, the Lunalilo Trust for uh, uh, Kapuna's home, which is great. I'm just not sure why that couldn't have been budgeted. I'm, I don't know if why that needed sure. to be an extraordinary expense. And it's a construction project. It was going on. They didn't know it was going to happen sooner. You, you also were very concerned about the trustee expenditure accounts. Uh, trustees get, what is that, 22 or 23000 dollars $22,000 a year to use at their discretion, uh, and uh, they, they write the checks and so forth directly. What was your concern about this? That was one of the, I, I think I stated blatantly that it was insane. They were co-mingling funds into their, so they were taking their allowance of money and putting it into the not not and I say they is too broad. There were some so. examples of that occurring, which is disturbing. In addition, anyone who works for an organization knows that for the most of the time, if you're actually trying to track spending and keep a handle on things, you go and spend the money yourself, and then you write a little form to your finance department. You say, I need to get reimbursed for this, and then they reimburse you. You don't go around just handing out the money. And when you do allow a flexible situation like that, you get the audit. And there were expenditures on 
like I said, tickets for a rodeo, which maybe been a good thing, but you could have applied for it. You didn't need to get a, a trustee directly to give you money for it. They're paying each other's health bills. I mean, they're, one trustee was paying for the health expenses of another trustee's spouse. There was an, a tuition or rent was being paid of beneficiaries directly by the, the trustees. And that's just, how is that not a conflict of interest? There was a quote of one of the trustees that said, you know, I'm not going to use these funds because it seems strange to me, and I'm paraphrasing, to be paying my voters. I'm going around and I'm giving out money directly to the people who will be voting in the election. One person who objected to including trustee accounts said to me, there's no real problem here because don't we expect that executives have perks? <laughs> now, what is your thought about that? Should trustees have these kind of perks? No. The, the expenditure accounts should just be completely eliminated. They should be kept strictly to a reimbursement process. The CEO, sponsorships, I, why, why? Why does that exist? Well, if people want to follow your work further, just Google Samuel Wilder King II and look at your, your article. We've got about a minute left, Sam. If you were called upon OHA to consult and to tell them what they should do now moving forward in light of the audit, what would you say real quickly? I think you refocus on the bread and butter issues. And to do that, you start eliminating some of the processes that are distracting. So eliminate the trustee account funds, have it all be reimbursable, eliminate the CEO sponsorships, and get back to focusing on what the research division is pointing out. We're missing all these targets. We need to reallocate our funds only towards getting Hawaiians median income stack up, health indicators up, and home ownership up. So OHA should be committed to helping Hawaiians improve in the areas of bread and butter issues. That's it. Well, very good. Sam, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for your courage in speaking out. Thank you. My guest today, Samuel Wilder King, is sharing his mana'o, his understanding of the recent audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And uh, I encourage you to Google him and see what else he's written. My name is Keili'i Akina on Hawaii Together. You're watching the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next time, aloha.